Manuel de Lorie-Coutier. I'm part of the Athena team, uh, and I'll be discussing computational brain connectivity mapping. Uh, before I get into the heart of that subject, however, I'll just introduce myself very briefly. Um, so my path to INRIA is a bit unusual in that I started my, uh, my studies in mechanical engineering. Uh, and so this was in Montreal, Canada. Uh, and after uh, mechanical engineering, I switched to a master's degree in electrical engineering, where I worked on signal processing and medical imaging, mostly on MEG. Um, I then moved to Singapore across the globe for uh, to, again, work on sampling theory, this time uh, in medical imaging and diffusion MRI. And so I'll clarify exactly what I mean by diffusion MRI and MEG uh, in the next few slides. And after four years in Singapore, moved back to Montreal or to Sherbrooke, in fact, for a postdoc fellowship in the Sherbrooke Brain Connectivity Imaging Lab, uh, where I kind of fused the two methodologies that I used before. So I, I uh, merged together diffusion MRI and MEG. Uh, and then in 2017, uh, I moved to France to join the ERC Advanced Grant COPCOM of Rashid Arish uh, to work on computational brain connectivity mapping. And so the initial contract was for two years in 2017, but uh, I enjoyed the work of the region. And so we decided to extend that contract to the end of the ERC, um, which was an extra two years. And then, uh, as was said, I applied for a permanent position and so got an ESF pay position last September. Uh, and here we are. So what am I working on? So the global objective, um, I will just cite someone who has said it better than me. It's that the last frontier of the biological sciences, the ultimate challenge, is to understand the biological basis of the consciousness and the brain processes by which we feel, act, learn, and remember. So this is a quote from the principles of neuroscience. It's obviously a more biologically oriented definition of our objective. And so here at Inria, instead of having the biological point of view, we try to model the brain using uh, or from a computer science and mathematics point of view. And so maybe a reformulation of this on a much uh, less grand scale, I would say, is that we ask the question, how can medical imaging and computational models further our understanding of the structure and function of the brain? In other words, how can we model and image the brain to try to understand it? And how from this relatively small organ, uh, can emerge consciousness. So the brain itself is a relatively small organ, as I said, it's about 1.2 liters in volume, uh, but it contains an incredible 90 million interconnected neurons. And all of these neurons are supported by approximately 40 to 130 billion glial cells. So it's a mind boggling complex object. You could argue that it's one of the most complex objects in the known universe. Uh, and so we want, when we want to study it, so we have a choice to make. Either we look at very small units of the brain, for example, individual neurons or small units of, you know, small, but I mean millions of interconnected neurons. Or we can try to look at the global scale, but on the global scale, we have to make certain assumptions, right? There's no hope of trying to model this complexity numerically. And so this is the avenue that we take, but then we realize that it's impossible to gain any insight into the global operation without simplifying assumptions. So one of these assumptions is brain parcellations. So if we take the cortical surface of the brain, which you can see rotating here, so this is a, a data-driven representation of the brain. It comes from an MRI image where we extract the surface. Uh, and we look at the surface and we try to say that it's, it can be decomposed into a set of homogeneous regions. And so if you assign to each region a color, you might end up with something that looks like this. So here, each colored region is homogeneous. But exactly what homogeneous means depends on your point of view. Uh, if you're looking at cells, then homogeneous for you might mean that the composition of the regions is, the, the, from a cellular point of view, is the same and different across regions. If you're looking at connectivity, then you might say that the regions have similar connectivity to other regions, but that the connectivity is different across regions. Or you might have a functional definition. You might say that, for example, the occipital lobe, which is in blue in the back of the brain, uh, is related to visual, and then the limits of the visual processing area uh, are illustrated by the colors, right? So then it's a functional point of view of brain parcellation. But in any case, you have to choose one of those parcellations and separate the brain into homogeneous areas, and then you can look at them individually. So for example, you can assign a node to each of those brain regions. So here, what you see is the same parcellation I had before. This is the Desican-Kiliani atlas, and it's based on the, uh, the topology of the brain. 
it has about 70 regions for both for both hemisphere. And so what we can do is assign a node to each of these regions and then try to quantify um, what that region is, uh, what is its purpose. So is it, for example, visual areas, if you were in the occipital lobe, are they motor areas or sensory motors area, motor area if we're in the superior central part of the brain? Uh, and for a long time, this is what we did. But more recently, and I mean recently, maybe 40 years, we started to be interested more in how these regions are communicating, right? So not specifically how they're specialized, but how they're exchanging information. So how are these regions sharing information, collaborating to reach higher level processes or complete actions? Uh, and so there's a, a change of focus where we tr where we go from trying to understand how information is segregated in the brain to how it's integrated across the brain. And then the question becomes, how do we quantify these links, right? How do we acquire or how do we assign weights to the different edges that uh, connect the regions of the brain for the atlas that you've chosen? And so there are several ways to do this. We I will focus on a few here. The first one is uh, diffusion MRI. So in diffusion, you get a set of volumes, a set of images that look like here. So here I've, I have given three examples. And diffusion quantifies the amount of water displacement in every voxel. And a voxel is just a three-dimensional pixel. Uh, and so because we're quantifying water displacement, you can imagine if there's a lot of obstacles and these obstacles are aligned. For example, if you have axons, which are the, extent, the extensions of neurons, uh, and we model them as simple cylinders. So if you have a whole bunch of cylinders that are all on the same axis, they're all aligned together, then water will diffuse more easily along the, the cylinder axis and more, um, it will be more hindered if you're perpendicular to the cylinder axis. And so diffusion contains information about the microstructure, the cell information uh, within each voxel. And we can extract a lot of information from this. And one of this information is, for example, the orientation of the structure in each voxel. And so if you zoom in, you might see the bottom picture where here we extracted the print, a few orientations for each voxel of the brain. And you can see their structure here, right? So the, we, we can see a continuum. We can follow with our eyes the lines that these little um, directions are tracing at each voxel. And so we can indeed integrate this numerically. And then what we'll end up with is something that looks like this. So we end up with these lines, what we refer to as streamlines. And they're a digital representation of axons. So they occur in the white matter, and they're what connect the different regions of the brain that I illustrated in my previous slides. So if you were to show all of the streamlines that you get from this process, it would be a mess, and you wouldn't be able to see anything. So here I've extracted a few of them of interest. And so in red, what you're seeing are the axons that connect the spinal cord on the bottom to the motor areas that are located in the superior part of the brain. And we also see some streamlines in green that connect the occipital lobe to the temporal. And so you can do this for several pairs of region. And in fact, if you can do it for every pair of region, and if you do, you might end up with a matrix, something that looks like this. So in other words, we, we take every pair of region A and B, we count the number of streamlines that connect that pair of region A and B, and we assign that number to the row and column A and B of a matrix. And so you end up with something that looks like this, where we can notice, I'm not sure if you can see your cursor, my cursor, but I hope so, uh, where we can see in the top part the um, uh, connectivity within a hemisphere, so left to left connection, right to right connection here. We can see the diagonal element which appears, which are self-connections between regions, and we can see also the cross-hemisphere connectivity that you see on the off-diagonal blocks. So this is one way to quantify, and it's, we call this a structural network, because what we're quantifying are the uh, the cells that connect the individual regions, right? So they're they're uh, relatively stable in time uh, and represent the uh, the structure of the network. But we can also do this functionally. So if we do it with functional MRI, uh, in fMRI what we obtain is a time series for every voxel of the brain. We can we're usually only interested in what's happening on the cortical surface, and so we can project this volume onto a surface and animate it in time. And this is what you're seeing here. So the regions are lighting up as a function of time and changing. And if you were to do this uh, with a subject that's been placed in the scanner, in the scanner, sorry, and asked to do nothing. So for example, you place a person in the scanner and you, you ask them to actively think about nothing, whatever that means. Uh, then you end up with a time series and you might be interested in quantifying how the different brain regions are activating and deactivating together. 
Uh, and again, you end up with a matrix that looks something like this. So here, instead of quantifying being a number of streamlines, it's a correlation coefficient between every pair of region and the network. And again, we see a certain structure. So of course we have ones on the diagonal because that is self-correlation. But we also see off-diagonal elements, which are correlation between um, homo homologous reg uh, regions across hemispheres. And then we see uh, correlation within hemisphere again. So this is again a network, but it's now a functional one. So it's a different view on, on the brain, which is obtained with a different modality, functional MRI in this case. So now we have two pairs of matrices, which are two views on the same network. And what do we do with those? Well, one avenue, one application, is to try to predict one from the other. If we assume that the structure, to make an analogy, corresponds to roads, then function would be the cars that are moving along that road. And so, in some sense, function constrains structures. So this is a representation that you're seeing animated here. We see information flowing through the different connections of the brain uh, to uh, transfer information between regions. So there's hope that we can predict, at least partially, functional connectivity given the structural network. So I won't go through detailed results here, but the, uh, the conclusion of this type of work is that it is indeed possible, but simple models tend to work much better than complicated ones. Uh, and one of the possible reasons is that these objects, when we measure them, there's a lot of noise. The pipelines involved to compute them is very complex, has a lot of parameters. Uh, and so there's still a lot of work to be done on quantifying the structure and the function of the brain using different modalities. Of course, that's just one example, so we can do many other things with those networks. So we can try to analyze them to extract significant properties. So for example, uh, their small worldness, if you treat it as a network or their modularity. And then you might ask, how does the imaging pipeline change those features of the network? You might also add a dynamic aspect to it because the structural is constant across time, but function changes, of course. It depends on what you're doing in the scan. And so you might try to quantify the dynamics of the network. You can also try to align them because, of course, uh, if you separate the brain into many regions, every brain is unique. And so the atlas that you use, the parcellation, might not correspond to the specific subject you're looking at. And so there's a permutation of labels that you need to take care of. And then maybe the last step is to try to go to high temporal resolution because what I've discussed here is using functional MRI. And the temporal resolution of functional MRI is roughly one second. So obviously that's pretty slow. The brain is working a lot faster than second resolution. And so we can use other modalities to try to get a much, uh, spate, much more temporally resolved view into brain networks. And this is exactly what MEEG does. So in MEEG, what you're seeing here, as we place sensors on the surface of the scalp of a subject, and we measure pot potential differences between the electrodes in EEG or the magnetic field uh, in MEEG. And what we end up with is a time series but this time the resolution is on the order of the millisecond. So it's a lot faster than fMRI, about three orders of magnitude. Uh, however, we're measuring not activity of the brain itself, but the potential differences generated on the surface of the scalp from electrical activity in the brain. And so there's an inverse problem to solve to go from sensors to brain activity. And this problem is, is ill-posed. We have a lot fewer sensors than the brain has degrees of freedom. And so what we try to do is to add biological priors into this inverse problem to try to constrain it. And one source of those priors is diffusion MRI. So if we know how the regions are connected temporally, can we try to constrain the problem to uh, recover the activations more precisely? In other words, we're trying to find a link between the underlying white matter structure here and the actual cortical activity that's happening on the surface of the brain. And I'll try to do an analogy here to uh, get you to understand the, the link between the two, which I think is pretty easy to grasp. So if we assume again the road analogy, then these streamlines correspond to roads. They tell you where the road exists. Uh, and you can ask certain questions. For example, what is the shortest path between two regions? And what are, the, what are all paths between two regions? There are some questions, however, that we can't answer. For example, there's no direct directionality information. We don't know if the road goes from A to B, from B to A, or both. We also don't have a notion of in-use. So on the road network, this means you see the map, but you don't have real-time traffic. You don't know if cars are on the road at this very moment. 
functional data is more like traffic cameras. So if you place certain traffic cameras along your road network, you can, um, you can see displacement of cars along those three points. And so, for example, you might get information that someone started at home at 8, stopped at the gas station at 8.22, and ended up at work at 8.47. And so is this information to recover the route that was taken? Well, it depends on the sampling rate. If you have enough information, if you have enough points along the way, you might be able to do this. Or if there are fewer, if there are not many roads that connect those points, then you might also be able to do it. Uh, and to see how this might work, you can think of the following example. Let's see, I see this brain state on the left at moment A, and I see this brain state at moment B. And in between those two brain states, there's 20 milliseconds. And I know for a fact that information travels at 6 meters per second. This is an assumption. If I have two connections connecting these two regions, one is 120 millimeters and the other is 240, well, I can do a quick uh, règle de trois and figure out that the first one is the connection that was used, right? So we can isolate the path given functional information. If something simple changes, we preserve information speed, but we change the delay. We make it 40 milliseconds now. Well, we know that it can't have used the 120 milliseconds because information would have gotten there faster. So now it has to be the second connection, 240 millimeters. But you might also end up in this situation where the delay is 30 millimeters. Again, information at six meters per second. And then there are no connections that explain the data you're looking at. So we also have to take into account that the measurement, the measurements that we're using, the imaging modalities, they're imperfect. They might be missing connections. They might add incorrect connections. They have noise in general. And so we also have to account for missing information in that system. But if you do all of this correctly, you might end up with something like this. So these are videos that you can see of uh, re uh, information flow reconstruction from both diffusion MRI and EEG. They're from two different tasks. So the brain on the left is a left visual stimulus followed by a right hand movement. And the one on the right is a right visual stimulus with, a again, a right hand movement. And then I'll wait for the video to finish in a few seconds and I'll describe what's happening in real time. And there we go, we're back at the start. And so you can see information coming in from the right and uh, sorry, from the right and hitting the left temporal lobe first. The other, uh, this is um, happening the other way around for this brain because the visual stimulus was shifted. Afterwards, there's a period where information is transferred between, between the two occipital lobes and into the frontal lobe. And after a while, we also see activation of the left motor region, which is consistent with a right hand movement. And because here we're in MEG, MEG, uh, all of this happens in 300 milliseconds. So this, all of this is happening extremely quickly in the brain. And so there is hope to recover this information, but obviously this is still, there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, for example, on the hypothesis that we make on the information speed and the amount of uh, connectivity that we can handle within those systems, and this is what we're actively working on. So I hope I've given you an overview of what we work on. Thank you for your attention. And of course, this work has been funded by the ERC and also by Troisier. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Samuel. So this is time for, uh, for the question. And Bruno, you have one question, so the floor is yours. OK. Uh, yes. Hi, hello, hello, everybody. Hello, Samuel. Thank you for this very interesting talk. Uh, I actually have two questions which are short. I, I'm going to ask the first one and we will go to the second one. So you, you have shown uh, matrices uh, related to anatomical or, or functional connectivity. Well, of course, as soon as you have a matrix, <laughs> the natural idea is to compute eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Uh, it's not clear to me if the first matrix is, is symmetric, the connectivity matrix, but nevertheless, you can compute eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And I think it gives you hints about something about the, the, the structure. In particular, instead of having regions, you have linear combinations of regions in, in, in the eigenvector. And I would like to know if you have studied that and if you can give to it any meaning. So you're absolutely correct. So this is indeed one of the ways we look at those matrices, uh, in particular for this aspect. So the, to answer your question, so the, the, the first matrix is not positive semi-definite. It is symmetric, but because they're all positive entries, you might have negative eigenvalues. It's not the case for the functional matrix. So the functional matrix is a positive semi-definite, positive definite, in fact, matrix. Uh, 
uh, because it's a it's essentially a covariance matrix. Um, and yes, so when we try to predict one from the others, there's a whole family of models that are based on eigen decomposition of those matrices. And uh, so yes, we do actively look at that, not only myself, but a whole, I would say, subfield of people that do structure, structure function mapping. Um, and you're also correct that these eigenvectors have a very specific meaning. So other people also look at those vectors as subnetworks, right? And so your your global brain activity is a linear combination of subnetworks that are activating and deactivating together. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my second question is about your minimization problem. Uh, you are minimizing the Kullback Lieber divergence with yes. uh, two constraints. One, which is natural, which is a normalization, and the second, which uh, basically constrains the first order moment. My question would be what happens if, is it reasonable or, uh, or relevant to consider also second order mo moments in the minimization procedure like, because they are related to some correlation? Uh, Okay, so you're very quick to have spotted this in the three questions that I put, but very good. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, so we, we didn't look at the correlation matrix. You're right, we, can, we usually, when we put the second order moment, um, it's usually temp temporally invariant because we, we you don't at the moment compute temporal correlation matrices. Um, so we don't look at them in, in this problem. You, you can add them in the, um, divergence term. So here the divergence is, so I can go maybe into a bit of details into what we're actually doing here. So the whole objective of, of this strategy is to say, I'm going to build a prior uh, on the activation. So P of X are the brain activations that I expect to see. So X are a discretized set of points on the cortical surface. And P of X is the probability of observing that particular configuration of sources on the surface of the brain. And so we say that we're going to build a prior uh, on that distribution. And the way to build this prior is to use connectivity information that comes, for example, from diffusion, and we can also build priors from fMRI. And so the DKL is with respect to some known prior that I, I didn't list here, but so there's a there's notation missing here that would say I have a second prior. And on this one, you can specify variances that you expect. So you, you we do add um, variance constraints on the prior. So that's how we include them, but not explicitly as a constraint term here. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. 